All right. Okay, so is there a role for immunotherapy in oncogene-driven cancers? Um, and as um, uh, Josh mentioned, I'm Helena Yu. I, um, I work at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So what I will talk about is um, kind of just uh, briefly going over how we treat uh, non-small cell lung cancer in 2019. Um, I'm going to focus on EGFR as our sort of um, targeted uh, therapy subset. I think you could extrapolate and use Al ALK or ROS1, but because it's a bigger population, we just have a little more data. So does IO work in EGFR mutant lung cancer? What are potential unexpected toxicities? Uh, and what's next on the horizon? So uh, I think this is a, a figure that potentially sort of summarizes how we treat stage four lung cancer, so metastatic lung cancer. I think when you meet a doctor, um, they, you know, you'll have probably undergone a biopsy. Um, so you're gonna look at the histology, what the cancer looks like under the microscope, do that genetic testing, the molecular molecular analysis, and then you'll get pdl one testing. So that is a protein marker on the surface of cancer cells, and the number goes anywhere from zero to 100%. And then based on those kind of three factors, we decide how to treat people. Um, and so I think we talked about in our separate breakout groups this morning, if you have a target like EGFR, ALK, ROS1, or BRAF, you're going to get your targeted therapy. And then I think if you are uh, pdl one high expressing, so greater than 50%, most of us would give Keytruda or Pembrolizumab alone, and then if you are um, less than 50%, so anywhere from 0 to 49, um, we often give um, chemotherapy combined with immunotherapy. And then this is sort of the breakdown of, uh, you know, you take 100 patients that are newly diagnosed, how, where they would fit in these different categories. Okay, um, I won't spend a ton of time on this, but I think all of the sort of data or how we as docs make our decisions are based on um, big clinical trials where we test different um, sort of treatment regimens against one another and really come up with what we think is the best treatment for certain um, clinical scenarios. So um, this study, this Keynote 024, was a study looking at uh, patients that had that high protein expression, so greater than 50%, and then randomized them. So half the people got the Keytruda, half the people got the standard at the time, which was um, chemotherapy uh, that fits their tumor histology. Um, I think just important to note that this study, along with many studies in this situation, uh, prevented or uh, prohibited people to have um, EGFR or ALK uh, mutations. Um, and so these are curves, which I'm sure you probably have seen um, earlier this morning, but it's looking to just be able to see um, a benefit. And there's two different sort of um, main criteria, the progression-free survival, so time that a treatment works for uh, patients, and then overall survival, so how long patients live with their disease. And you can see that if you are highly expressing PDL1, uh, Keytruda was better than chemotherapy in that setting. And so the four people, and then this is Keynote 189, which is another large study, and this was looking at patients that, um, uh, so all, all patients, and looked at basically uh, PDL1 expression, but randomized people to either um, chemotherapy with Keytruda or chemotherapy by itself. Uh, again, we didn't include people with these mutation subsets. And then, uh, you know, for this larger population, um, getting the Keytruda helped people live longer, um, but also helped people's cancer stay controlled for longer, too. And you can see, um, this is a little bit granular, but um, if you had higher PDL1 expression, you did better with the immunotherapy. So it really seems like a biomarker, something that can help us predict which patients will benefit. Um, and this is just the progression-free survival curves. And then one last clinical trial that I'll talk about is um, the EMPOWER 150. And this is the same kind of concept of using chemotherapy with or without immunotherapy, um, but we're using Avastin as well. Um, and we talked about this morning um, about how Avastin sometimes makes certain treatments work a, a little better as well. And it was the same thing, adding chemotherapy, excuse me, atezolizumab, a different kind of immunotherapy, to the chemotherapy and Avastin combination uh, did look better than, than just the chemotherapy of Astin alone. Um, so I think just to go back to our little um, kind of diagram, I think that, you know, there are different chemotherapy regimens that you would talk to your doctor that you could potentially combine with immunotherapy if that was right for you, um, but this is sort of where we are. Um, so I think a question, especially since all of those first-line studies didn't include people with EGFR mutations, is how do we fit this and the sort of all the effectiveness that we have been hearing about of immunotherapy to different sort of mutation subsets? Um, so this is a little table that basically um, 
Uh, before we used immunotherapy as first treatment for metastatic lung cancer, we used it as later line treatment. And we talked about this this morning that a lot of times effective drugs get tested first in the later line setting, and then if they show effectiveness, they get moved up to be earlier and earlier in people's uh, treatment course. And so these are all different immunotherapies that were initially approved as um, single agent treatment, so just treatment by itself with immunotherapy alone, but in the, the later line setting. Um, this is a small figure, but it's basically saying that in those smaller studies of immunotherapy in the later line setting, they look to see were there certain populations of patients that benefited more or benefited less. And you can see that patients that had EGFR mutations look like they actually did better with the standard of care arm, which is uh, chemotherapy docetaxel compared to immunotherapy. So um, really discrepant results from the, the trials at, at large, which showed a good benefit of immunotherapy. And so does immunotherapy work by itself as treatment for EGFR mutant lung cancer? Really no, and I think that um, after these big studies have come out, a bunch of uh, us kind of uh, uh, docs who treat um, a lot of patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer looked back and said, of our patients that had this type of lung cancer, did they respond to immunotherapy? And the response rates were pretty low, uh, close to zero in this setting. Um, so this actually is hot off the press. It came out a couple weeks ago in a big journal where this was the first study where it was a prospective study, uh, so looking at um, immunotherapy with chemotherapy, but in particular um, allowing patients with EGFR mutant lung cancers. Um, so they, there was 58 patients on the study um, that had sensitizing EGFR mutations, which really means they had mutations that um, respond to the available EGFR our inhibitors, um, and then they also included uh, 31 patients with ALK fusions as well, um, and then tested this kind of concept of chemotherapy uh, with or without immunotherapy. Um, and this was the you know exciting for a lot of us because it was the first study that in these mutation subsets um, showed potential benefit of adding immunotherapy to chemotherapy because they were excluded from all the other studies. This is really the first study of, of its type. And so I think paying attention in particular to the ALK, ALK rearrangements and then the EGFR, but looking at exon 19 deletion and L858 arcs, and those are, make up almost 90% of um, EGFR mutant lung cancers. So, and then I think just, just these same curves again really showing that um, both time on treatment uh, was longer with the use of uh, or addition of immunotherapy, but as well, as well as people living longer with their cancers as well. And then just looking at, you can see we talked about forest plots in our, in our breakout earlier, but um, forest plots help us understand, you know, for certain subgroups where they break up a, a study population into different groups and looking for sort of benefit of one treatment versus the other. And these forest plots really just show us that um, for people that had the EGFR mutations, it did look actually better to um, do chemotherapy with um, immunotherapy compared to chemotherapy alone. And then this is, um, we didn't talk about this this morning, but um, nivolumab and ipilimumab are two different immunotherapies. So another option is if one immunotherapy doesn't work well by itself, can we get more of a response by combining two together? And this is really small numbers. When it says N equals eight, that means it's eight patients. But in eight patients that had EGFR mutant lung cancer who were in this study looking at the combination, um, the response rate that they reported for those eight patients was 50%. So four of them did have major shrinkage, and that's kind of a you know small but potentially positive signal um, that uh, has kind of um, led to a larger study of this combination in EGFR mutant lung cancer. And then one other thing to kind of bring up in terms of what data we have for immunotherapy in EGFR mutant lung cancer, so we, um, the Pacific study. So this is a study of um, if people have earlier stage lung cancer, so stage three lung cancers that are potentially curable, usually um, docs recommend a combination of radiation and chemotherapy. So in that setting, they get that, which is their curative treatment. Um, but there was a study called the Pacific study that gave half of the patients after they got their definitive treatment, dervalimab, which is another immunotherapy, and then the other half got placebo or no additional treatment. Um, and this was, you know, big news over the last couple years as well, and Josh actually put up the approval of dervalimab in 2018 um, because 
um, in the setting of giving that after radiation, um, survival was longer. So we were able to actually cure more people with the addition of this immunotherapy um, after um, uh, treatment for early stage lung cancer. Um, but one thing that I want to bring out, these are those forest plots again that kind of tell us um, who might be benefiting. You can see that for the PFS, which is time on treatment or the survival, um, the, when, when the, the lines that you see, when they cross that dotted line, it's saying that they're not clear what the benefit is or we're not sure if there's a benefit. And you can see that for patients, and I actually put the yellow box around the wrong thing, but if you look at patients that are EGFR mutant, have EGFR mutant lung cancer, the benefit of this Dervalimab was potentially, un, 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 it was unclear because of that sort of um, line crossing, crossing the one. Um, so I think that's another, uh, you know, they didn't exclude patients with EGFR <laughs> mutant lung cancer, but we, you know, we don't know, um, you know, is this a population that may not have that same benefit, which is sort of consistent um, with the other other studies of immunotherapy. And so one thing to also consider is, um, is there a potential toxicity um, with using some of these targeted treatments um, with um, uh, immunotherapy? And so um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we had this study, it's called the TATIN study, which was looking at Tegriso, um, one of the EGFR inhibitors, with different combinations, so different um, medications added to um, Tegriso. And one of the medicines we tried to add is Dervalimab, which is one of those immunotherapies. And and in that setting where we combined the two, um, we really saw a, a lot of toxicity. So one of the toxicities you can see with immunotherapy and targeted treatments too is something called pneumonitis, which is inflammation of the lung. Um, and Tegriso and Dervalimab separately have a very low frequency of this pneumonitis, less than 5%. But when we put these two together, um, we saw almost a 40% uh, sort of frequency of pneumonitis. And I think that that's part of um, you know, the challenge with clinical trials is sometimes, you know, we, we think we know what two different drugs do, but sometimes we get unexpected toxic, sometimes unexpected efficacy or effectiveness, but sometimes unexpected toxicity as well when we combine these different treatments. And so based on this, because we treated a few patients like this um, and, and saw those um, toxicities, we stopped the combination. So there's no further sort of combinations that I know of looking at immunotherapy and, and EGFR inhibitors. Um, because of this, this real concern for toxicity. Um, and, you know, so when, once we saw that, we said, oh, are there, you know, should we look for more data or, or sort of evidence about is there an interaction between EGFR inhibitors and immunotherapy? And this Japanese um, group looked at, um, so when people have, are, are on um, drugs, they can report side effects to the FDA. Um, and so the FDA has a big database of these potential side effects. And so they did a neat study where they basically looked at all patients with non-small cell lung cancer that got EGFR inhibitors and nivolumab, one of the other immunotherapies. And they saw that when people had both of those as part of their treatment, treatment history, there was a much higher um, incidence of pneumonitis, that inflammation of the lung. So again, another signal that potentially giving these two treatments um, both together, but also just sometime during the disease course um, or treatment course could be toxic. And what was interesting is when they could tell from the data that was provided sort of what treatment was given first and what treatment was given second, um, most of the patients that had the toxicity had the nivolumab first followed by the EGFR inhibitor. And so one thing when we think about drugs that's important is to think about the half-life or how long drugs stick, stick around in the system. And so after you've, you, uh, a patient gets immunotherapy, um, that we can see evidence of the drug sticking around almost a year later. So even though people are together, where you're still having kind of evidence of both drugs um, and potential toxicity too. Could you just clarify yeah. what was showing up in the, in the blood, the drug itself? So you can see evidence of the receptor that the drug targets. You can see evidence of receptor occupancy like a year later. So evidence that the drug is still kind of working in the body. From blood or tissue? From, from looking at the tissue, yeah. Feel free to stop me if you guys have questions. And so I think one of the things that's really valuable is, um, you know, at some of these, you know, uh, big cancer centers is once we see something like this, we say, oh, like what's our experience with our patients? Can we learn something um, from our patients? So this is something where, actually this is, actually 
one step back. This is this is something different. This is something that Dr. West brought up this morning. But um, you know, for patients that have EGFR mutant lung cancer um, and say they have that high protein PDL1 expression, one of the questions that comes up in the community is, you know, we know these immunotherapies work. So should we give people immunotherapy or should we give them targeted therapy if they have um, the EGFR mutation? And this is a study that was done that took people that had um, EGFR mutant lung cancer um, and were newly diagnosed. Um, and gave them immunotherapy instead of an EGFR inhibitor because of high PDL1 expression, that protein. Um, and seven of the 10 actually had very high PDL1 expression um, with greater than 50% expression. Um, but even with that sort of selection for a population that we think should have benefited from immunotherapy, um, zero out of 10 of them actually responded. So we had no um, sort of shrinkage or, or benefit from the immunotherapy. And I think this kind of fits for all of the different mutation subsets that we deal with where um, we have really effective targeted therapy and those really should be used first because I think um, that really seems to trump um, other, other treatments uh, for, for these patients. Um, but something to think about. And I think one thing to note that kind of helped prompt us to look further is after patients got immunotherapy, they got their targeted therapy, and some of them had pretty significant pneumonitis or side effects. So is there something that, uh, you know, was a reaction of, of, of getting the two, the two different treatments? And so this is what I had meant to talk about, where we looked at our um, MSK experience. This is a paper that we just published um, recently where we looked at people for various reasons who got immunotherapy first um, and then got, in particular, Tugriso, which is the EGFR inhibitor that we typically use. Um, and so maybe they got immunotherapy first because we didn't have mutation test results or they didn't have um, tissue available for mutation uh, testing. Um, uh, and, and, you know, so they got what we thought was appropriate, but we saw that there was actually a very um, kind of a, a higher incidence of problems or toxicity. Um, so uh, of the people that got immunotherapy followed by Tugriso, about 20% of them ended up having pneumonitis, which is pretty high. Um, so I think another sort of um, potential evidence that um, when, even when things are given sequentially, that there has to be sort of caution. I think this is, we're learning about this, right? Because I think in EGFR mutant lung cancer and other lung cancers, um, you know, we might give targeted therapy, then give other treatments like chemotherapy, but then we often go back to the targeted therapy we retreat. And so in that setting, um, you know, I think we're, gonna, we're learning more, but we might have to be careful when we go back from immunotherapy back to a targeted therapy because maybe we'll see, um, you know, potential side effects. With, with the OC? Yeah, no, the oh, stable disease. disease. Yeah. Okay. It's like prolonged stable disease. And I guess the other thing to note is most of the people, when they had the toxicity, um, there, there was, um, it happened pretty soon after we started the Tegriso. And then the other thing to note is we, we know a lot about pneumonitis, that inflammation of the lung, but we also saw colitis, which is inflammation of the colon, or hepatitis, inflammation of the liver. And five out of the six people where we saw this happen um, had to be hospitalized for side effects, so really serious side effects that required steroids and a lot of um, intensive uh, treatment. So, you know, these aren't small um, issues. These are really big issues for our patients. So thinking about what's next, um, so I think now that we know that, uh, you know, obviously there's lots of excitement about immunotherapy, but also some potential caution or concern for these, um, you know, never smoking kind of disease uh, mutation subsets. Um, so I think that there are a lot of studies that we hope will answer um, whether what the value is of immunotherapy in these populations. And so two of them that um, are, are, are ongoing now, open and enrolling patients, um, uh, one of them is thinking about kind of um, immunotherapy plus chemotherapy or two immunotherapies together. And these, these are in, uh, in particular in EGFR mutant lung cancer, um, and they're, they're for patients after they've been on EGFR inhibitors. Um, and then there's one of uh, Keytruda with immuno, with uh, plus, uh, immu, uh, excuse me, chemotherapy with or without Keytruda. So I think these might help us answer, um, you know, after EGFR inhibitors whether, um, you know, we should use chemo by itself or think about chemo plus immunotherapy. And so I think that there are 
still questions that um, that we need to answer. And I think, you know, as we mentioned, you know, is there a role for immunotherapy and chemotherapy together? Um, that Empower 150 study um, didn't treat a lot of patients, but really did look quite positive in terms of, um, you know, there being a benefit for EGFR mutant uh, patient, lung cancer patients with uh, the combination, um, and we're going to wait for some of those bigger studies. And I think a big thing is defining this potential toxicity, because I think, you know, our hope is that our patients live for a really long time and they get a lot of different treatments, and one of the things that we don't really think about is um, potential increase in toxicity with sequencing, right, where we kind of focus on what treatment our patients are getting and what toxicities are there, but do we need to be thinking about order, and if someone's had something, immunotherapy, and then they get an EGFR inhibitor, should we have have kind of heightened awareness of potential toxicity, so something we need to learn more about. Um, and then I think, you know, thinking about all the ways that immunotherapy is used, I think one of the questions where I know that a lot of people practice differently is should people get um, dervalimab after sort of radiation for earlier stage cancer? Um, and then, of course, I know that, you know, the interest in a lot of the other cancers like ALK positive cancer or ROS1 is high in this group, so I think, you know, for these really small subsets, as Josh was saying, I think we need to kind of pool our information um, so that we can get a better sense of whether um, these other mutation uh, positive lung cancers respond to immunotherapy. Um, and so I think just the, the, the one thing that I'll conclude with um, that I think is really important is just using your best treatments first. Um, I think that not everyone gets the second line treatment, and so I think starting with what we have the most data for that we know is the most effective. So I think for people that have targetable mutations, we have to start with the targeted therapy first. Um, I think that's the big thing, and I, and I sort of said most of these other points. But happy to answer any questions you guys have. <coughs>